let's uh, take a look at a few news articles. Um, see if I can get past all the garbage. All right, so this is a pretty good idea. They have a tidal kite. They lower something into the ocean and spread it out like a kite and get energy from the motion of the water under the surface. And apparently it's quite effective. A uh, huge thing exports power to the grid. Uh, this seems like it might be a good idea. Um, it's good to see prototypes like that happening. Uh, let's see if there's any way to dig past all the garbage. Perhaps not. Yeah, so Apple Vision Pros are out there. Um, some people say they're too heavy. Other people say this guy says they're wonderful on airplanes. So you can totally give yourself the illusion of being somewhere nicer than you are. And uh, says they're great for that, so that's a thing to be aware of. They also something he mentioned in here, which I didn't know about. There's this stuff you should swab your nose with called Nosin, which decreases your chance of catching a cold or COVID or something on the flight. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. Maybe I'll try that. Uh, so this is interesting. And, uh, and technically, not too surprising, people, now everybody has security cameras, so all you have to do is jam the Wi-Fi before you rob a house, and that's what these people are doing in Minnesota. Nine Minnesota burglaries, they jam the Wi-Fi to turn off the cameras. So uh, it does seem like an obvious thing to do, and they see if you don't know how to build a jammer, you can just buy one online. Uh, they are available. They're technically illegal to use, but you can buy them. And, uh, that's an interesting thing to know. It wouldn't take much to do it. Just a noisy uh, electric motor would do it to some extent too, but I presumably those special devices are even better. So Honda, like Toyota, really believes in hydrogen. And they're selling hydrogen cars. Now, uh, this would seem to be a problem because you can't get hydrogen anymore in California. They just closed the six hydrogen stations in California because of lack of supply. But apparently, it's fuel cell SUV, so I guess you can charge it as an electric car, too. It's not entirely clear here, but that's a thing to know. Um, I guess some other nations must actually have a better hydrogen supply than we do, or someone thinks they will. ZFS is a Linux file system. It's considered very advanced, and it has an encryption option, but apparently the encryption option is defective. There was a vulnerability where it would um, corrupt your data, and they fixed it, and now more problems have occurred that corrupt your data. So that's pretty rude. If it encrypts your data, you can't get it back. So that's not reassuring. And I dig through all the ads and garbage. Uh, so this is kind of interesting about San Francisco. Uh, there are a small number of oligarchs in San Francisco, tech billionaires, and they are trying to influence policy a lot, of course, um, I know I heard a lot about David Sachs and these other guys. One of these is the guys that just said, uh, uh, yeah, Gary Tan, the Y Combinator's chief executive, he said last week that a particular city supervisor should die a slow death on Twitter or something, and that person's getting death threats now, so he's resembling Elon Musk. They all generally resemble Elon Musk, and, and their position is generally that you should get rid of all the homeless people and uh, all the robbery on the street and crime and stuff and make the city pleasant for them. Uh, to turn this into the way red states are, by just having more and more brutal police crackdowns, which is what they like. And so, anyway, they're having a significant influence on politics, and it's interesting to read. Um, certainly, I do sympathize with their position. Downtown San Francisco is not fun to visit. I don't think it's going to do the tourist business any good. It's, it really would be nice if they could somehow make it more pleasant down there. But uh, many mayors and governors have tried for decades, and nobody seems able to really do anything about it. Um, so this guy made a USB stick that will self-destruct. You have to plug it in three times quickly to use it, and if you don't, it will heat up and just self-destruct. So uh, they also suggest that even 100 degrees Celsius is not enough to destroy the RAM, and you ought to add, like, an explosive part to it, which he doesn't want to give you, but you can get it. So uh, this is an option, I suppose, if you're completely insane. Um, most people would simply encrypt their data. <laughs> would seem to accomplish the same thing with a lot less drama. And this is useful in case you don't know it. Multi-factor authentication is more and more present, and there are, are it can generally be defeated with social engineering. So the, here's one. If you can get yourself in the middle on the network, then you can intercept passwords and the two-factor code, and then pass them both onto the website, so the person actually logs in, but the attacker also gets in. Um, 
You can do prompt bombing. This is the one I hear the most about. You just try over and over and over to log in, and the person's phone will just keep getting these prompts. And many people will eventually just click OK to make it stop, thinking something is just wrong with their phone. Uh, that works pretty well. Uh, you can also trick the help desk into letting you in by just social engineering them, convincing them you've lost your second factor, you lost your phone or something, and, and until they just bypass it and reset your password and turn off the two-factor authentication. And another one where you convince the uh, cell phone company that you have lost your phone and they need to transfer your account to a different phone. That's SIM swapping. And now you, uh, you control the phone and therefore you have everything. You receive SMSs on that phone and get in the two factors that use SMS anyway. All right. Um, so there's an article that came out from some group called Turquoise Roof uh, where they claim they have decoded China's digital surveillance in Tibet. And the part that I thought was very interesting about this is apparently in Tibet, the local police will force you to install this app. And they say the app is very nasty and it's spying on you. So I got this app and I'm planning to add this to the Android class. I went through quite a bit of analysis of it and it's very interesting. Um, mostly this app appears to be um, the Anti-Fraud Center app and most of it seems to be reasonable um, functions like it has a private message where you can verify the person at the other end like Signal. It has a bunch of places where you can report um, uh, that I've found a fraudulent website or somebody is doing something illegal around here to the police. But it also, but the thing they noticed here, which you can also verify, and I'll have it in the project, is it has a whole lot of outrageous permissions. It has permissions to access all your storage, all your pictures, intercept SMSs and everything else, your emails and everything. And there's a special police login page. So the police can log in on your phone and then presumably access all of that. And so um, it does make sense. Uh, this seems like uh, this is what you would, this is, I imagine someone like Donald Trump would like to do this to Muslims in America. If you have a group of people and you think some of them are subversive or terrorists, then you might force them all to have this app so the police can inspect who you've been sending messages to and such. Um, anyway, it's very interesting. And the thing I already noticed, several security flaws in the app. It, says it won't run on a rooted phone, but if you just use, put it on a rooted phone, and then use the um, command line commands, you can open the activities, and they open. And I was able to open the password reset utility, and it doesn't ask for the old password. So if I could register an account, I think I'd be able to force a password change on the rooted phone without knowing the old password. So that would be interesting. And um, anyway, that's why I'm, I'm only partway through investigating it. The last thing I want to investigate is the data uh, the databases on it. There's quite a few databases, and I suspect those contain all your emails, all your SMSs, and so on. And so uh, when I get a version of that working, I'll uh, put it on the end of the class. It's very interesting to see. Um, a lot of it is just reasonable functionality, and I, I imagine this is all legal in China, and it's what a lot of people would like to do here. The FBI would like to do this here. They're always held back by the Fourth Amendment and privacy advocates like the ACLU and the EFF, but the government certainly would like the ability to inspect everything on everybody's phone all the time here, too. And uh, they're just held back by some special rules we have here. And not held back all that much. Since the Patriot Act, the NSA, and therefore, to some extent, the FBI do have a lot of access to that. So uh, Scott Weiner, who is always passing bills like this in San Francisco, wants to pass an AI regulation bill. Um, I don't like it myself. I am I guess I'm one of these uh, tech Rose, I think that they don't understand AI well enough to pass any rules about it. Um, but he does want to pass some kind of rule limiting it. I think it will never pass because the tech lobbies are powerful enough to block it. By the way, something I should mention, there is um, one of my consulting gigs wanted me to help write their security rules for AI. And um, I think I mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. She's, uh, yeah, there is a framework for AI security and it only came out, yeah, this is it. So if, you're, if you want a good authoritative framework telling you how to secure AI, this is a good one from CISA and the NSA and the FBI and a whole bunch of other nations. This is a very interesting article and uh, somewhere is the button that opens it. Um, print, read the full report, okay. Uh, this is very nice. It explains what you have to do to secure AI, and these seem like really good recommendations. Here's all the agencies that have approved it. The French, Germany, the Israeli, Japan, Nigeria, everybody has approved it. 
And um, you got four things, secure design, secure development for people who are making the AI systems, and then for people who are just deploying them at their company, secure deployment and secure operation and maintenance. And it has very good ideas here. Um, it's uh, there, raise staff awareness of threats, model the threats, design your system for security as well as functionality and performance, uh, considering the external libraries you're using and so on. Uh, watch out for people trying to hack into your system. Um, user interaction, uh, be, communicate to your users about the defects of it, like bias and reliability. And then um, consider, when choosing an AI model, consider how complex it is, consider how interpretable it is. Are you gonna be able to understand why it works and be able to adjust it? Um, consider the training data. This is a big deal if they used copyrighted training data without permission, that could lead to trouble. If they used biased training data, then your model will be biased. You know, these are the real risks and your secure development. And then down here for deploying it, um, you have basic cybersecurity on your infrastructure, monitor and log actions on your model, um, have incident management, uh, instant response features, um, put in restrictions so it can't be abused and harm people and uh, educate users and make it clear to them what they're expected to do. And so and for operation and maintenance, monitor it, monitor the inputs, follow secure by design principles, collect and share lessons learned. You know, it's all reasonable stuff. Um, this I think is a good government document to help you secure AI. Anyway, I'm gonna stop the news.